Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here, and once again, it is time for the Monday Q&As. Sorry guys, it's a little late getting these up, been a long day, busy weekend. We were on another independent film set all weekend. I did a little bit of extra work as an actor. And there'll probably be footage of that up later. It was a fun day, though. We had a lot of fun, but it's time to get these Q&As done for you guys. So let's get this started. First question. Hello, sir. Can you explain a little bit more on why the high bar squat is superior to the low bar squat for an athlete? Let's say a runner or a rower. Doesn't the low bar squat involve more muscle mass and activate the posterior chain a little bit more to a certain degree? It wouldn't this be beneficial? Blah, blah, blah. All right, you guys can read the rest of the question down below. I've answered this previously, but I guess I'm going to rehash it again. A lot of new subscribers, so people don't know this. All right, a couple things going on. The difference in the posterior chain recruitment on the low bar versus the high bar is negligible. It's there, but it's not a whole lot. And the thing is, there are other exercises that are far superior for the posterior chain that you could be doing. Any sort of pulling from the floor, for example. So when we're looking at something like the squat, we shouldn't be worried about the, the posterior chain activation to the same degree. The reason that you can lift more weight on the low bar squat than the high bar has to do with things like knee torque angles and the shorter range of motion. For any given individual, you can move the weight a shorter distance. You move the weight a shorter distance with the low bar squat versus the high bar. And so the, the high bar lets you get deeper and it allows you primarily to move the weight further. So, so further movement with the same amount of weight is going to give you more muscle activation. Now, obviously you can lift a little more with the low bar, but again, it's due to the changed uh, range of motion, the changed knee torque angles, things like that. It's not necessarily <laughs> recruiting more muscle fibers. But the big difference for any sort of athlete is going to be, are you ever going to be dramatically further uh, apart with your feet in any sport that you play then shoulder width. A high bar squat is generally going to be shoulder width. That is most of your stances on any sort of playing field, any sport that you're, you're in. And the low bar is going to be a much wider stance. You're very rarely in any sort of athletic endeavor going to be at a super wide stance. So therefore, you're going to get better specificity of training by doing the high bar. So it's pretty straightforward. It's pretty simple. That's why. Longer range of motion, narrower stance. That's it. That's why there's better carryover to most sports. And it's not to say that a low bar is bad for sports. You can be a strong low bar squatter and it will carry over tremendously to sports. But you're going to get slightly better transference with the high bar squat, so that might as well be what you use. Stick to the low bar squat if you're a power lifter who uses it in competition. All right, next question. First of all, Jason and everyone, I found this uh, from a reliable source. Secondly, do naturals really need a shoulder day and an arm day? I've heard you already get enough work hitting those muscles from the compound exercises. You may not get enough from just the compound exercises, but uh, do naturals, drug-free lifters need an arm or a shoulder day? Absolutely not. They're absolutely not required to get maximum development. In fact, there's no reason to even split your routine up for maximum development unless you just happen to choose to do it that way. And I want people to understand that we can talk about what's efficient all day long, but what you choose to do is still down to personal preference and you can split things up and still make just as good a progress as you can on a full body program. It's the problem is when people say that it's the other way around that you will make better progress automatically on a split. That's the problem. Whereas, and I tell people that generally for most purposes, it's more efficient physiologically to do everything full body only you split your routine up, particularly for drug free lifters, but it comes down to personal preference. There's no, physiological benefit for you to be splitting things up. There might be personal preference benefits. So I'm not going to sit around and argue against people's personal preferences. If that's what you like to do and that's what gets you in the gym more consistently than do what you need to do. I'm always going to push in the direction for efficiency purposes, physiological purposes, the full body, but some people just don't like training that way. Now, as far as the other thing, do you need to isolate those muscles is kind of a second part of the question. It's only barely addressed in the question itself. Well, that depends. Uh, if you're looking at purely from a development perspective, a hypertrophy perspective, an aesthetics perspective, rather than a functional perspective, uh, the answer is maybe. You might need to isolate various muscles. It's going to depend upon what your weak points are. I'm going to say up front, you do not need to isolate every muscle in your body. 
what muscles you're going to need to isolate is going to depend on how efficient your compound movements are and what your genetics are like. What muscles grow slower and faster for you? Some people will have uh, just muscles that grow slower than others. If a muscle doesn't grow in proportion for you while doing all compound movements, you're going to need to isolate it to balance it out. Just that I tell most people there's probably no more than around three muscles or four muscles in your body that you personally need to be isolating though because at least half your muscles are going to grow faster than others. If they're growing fast from the compounds, you don't need to be isolating them. It's the stuff that's growing slower and if you're like me, actually my delts and arms are my slowest growing muscles so I personally have to isolate them. You might not need to. So that it's going to come down to an individual genetic thing. It's not a yes or no question. Do you need to isolate a muscle? Well, it depends on the person. Uh, depends on your structure. Depends on how you grow. But do you need to split them up and have a shoulder day and an arm day? Absolutely not. No reason for you to split things up unless you just choose to do it that way for personal preference. All right, next question. Could you please talk about programming for strength and distance running? I've been making great gains with squats and deadlifts, but due to my job, I've got to be able to run two to three miles in a reasonable time. I'm having trouble setting up my program so that I keep gaining on squats, uh, run, and have good recovery. Any good program should allow you to run on your uh, off days. Most good programs for your squat and deadlift are going to be three to four day a week programs. That leaves you on average another three days to work on your running in which you can recover. Uh, the thing that I'm confused here is that two to three miles is not distance running. That's a 5K. It's three miles is around 5K. That's not distance running. When you're talking distance running, you're talking about running 10 or 20 or 30 miles, not two or three. So you, it doesn't sound like distance running needs to be your focus at all if you need to run two or three miles for your job, uh, for whatever physical fitness standards they have. So you need to be focusing on shorter distance running. Two to three miles is not a really long run. So what I would recommend is that you slowly build up your stamina three days a week of running and you lift on your other three days and then take a day off. Pretty straightforward. There's plenty of programs that allow for that. I, most of my programs will allow for that. If there's any confusion, go check out Alex Viata's work on hybrid athletes. And that's a good place to look. But it doesn't sound like your goals are, are going to require anything too extreme. You just need to be running, not to failure, not to any sort of fatigue till you pass out or at, at maximum speed for two miles. But just start building up your stamina and continue to do a strength program three days a week for your squat and your deadlift. Not a problem. Shouldn't be an issue for you. Just going to take a little time to get there. All right, next question. I have been dieting for around six months and have around 15 to 20 pounds more to lose to get to 8 to 10% body fat for a clean bulk. I'm currently running a protein sparing modified fast diet and running your novice 3 by 5 for cutting. Uh, I have under three months of training experience. How many refeeds a week do I need? Uh, my calories and macros on a refeed. Thanks, Jason. Much appreciated. All right. Yeah, you're going to need a refeed every week if you're doing a protein sparing modified fast. I'm going to recommend you do a heavy refeed once a week. Mostly carbs. Keep the fat low. Keep the carbs high and the protein moderate. You don't need to set out specific macros. I don't even believe in counting these specific macros. Uh, just not necessary for most people's goals, but you're going to need to do a refeed on the protein sparing modified fast. The thing that concerns me is that you said 8 to 10% body fat. You're not on steroids, I'm going to assume. Don't cut under 10% body fat. Something I tell people over and over and over. Yes, a genetic minority of people, genetically gifted people in certain areas can cut to 8% body fat and be okay. We don't need to address those people because there aren't enough of them to make up my subscriber base. I have 75,000 subscribers. There aren't 75,000 people in the fitness community who watch YouTube who have the genetics to do that. We're talking 1% to 2% of the population. They're not important enough to make videos about. So for everyone else who isn't that special, unique snowflake, don't cut under 10% body fat. Stop at 10%. So when you get to 10%, go back on your clean bulk. So I do want to reiterate that point. Do not say 8 to 10%. There's a big difference. And at 8% body fat, you're going to have problems if you're drug-free for the majority of people. So don't cut that lean. But as far as the other thing goes, yeah, just do a heavy refeed. Eat like a 500-calorie surplus or as high as a 1,000-calorie surplus, high-carb, moderate protein, low-fat once a week on your refeed. Uh, otherwise, you are going to lose muscle on this protein sparing modified fast, even though you're still a, a novice lifter. So just be leery of that and get a good refeed in with lots of carbs to replenish muscle glycogen and get a super compensation effect. All right, next question. 
taking a year to travel with no lifting. Assuming an intermediate total before leaving on the trip, would it be worth the time and effort to do body weight partner lifts three times a week to keep some level of gains, even though food intake will likely not be sufficient? In the context that upon returning home, I start training again and get the fast return of gains, thanks. The fast return of gains when you come back from training is generally only about double the speed that you uh, gain on the first time. So if you have three years of training experience and you completely detrain for a year, it's going to take you a year and a half to get back where you were, just in my experience, roughly. I know that the same thing happened to me when I got sick and came back to training. I didn't bounce back to where I was at three year, the three-year mark, even though I'd been training for many years before that. My first year, I did not reach that. I only made normal noob gains again, or maybe slightly faster, about 50% faster. So I would say it took me something like two years to regain <laughs> where I was after three years of training originally. So it, it just doesn't work that way. I mean, muscle memory is, is powerful, but it's not as fast as people think. You don't regain a year's worth of gains in two months time. It doesn't work that way. So taking a full year off from training expect to restart back where you were and let's say you were a three-year intermediate expected a year and a half or more to regain uh, where you had previously been so the real question becomes what do you mean you can't train anywhere in the world even if you your world travels going over in a year are going to put you down in the congo in africa and let's say there's not a gym within a hundred miles of you you're out in the jungle find a tree to do chin-ups on have a partner jump up on your back and do squats find a big old log to do squats with Find a big log or a big rock on the ground to do deadlifts with. Go pick up a water buffalo calf if you need to. There are heavy things to pick up. You can find things to do assisted body weight stuff. You can do chin-ups. You can find a vine out in the jungle and tie a rock around your waist and do chin-ups with it. Find something to do dips on and do weighted dips the same way. So you could be out where there's no metal, no technology, nothing, and you can still find a way to lift weights. There are logs and rocks and vines and stuff out in the middle of the jungle 100 miles from civilization. So to say that you don't have access to weights is going to be ridiculous. And as far as food goes, you should be able to find food. Food is cheap around the world. And if you're, again, an American, you're, you've got enough money to be around the world doing something for a year. You've got enough money to afford calories wherever you go. Uh, you, it's just a matter of money. So again, I'm not buying this. Uh, you can't train. And the other question becomes, why would you not train? Look at the video I put out this morning about the health benefits. Why would you just take a year off from training instead of going and finding some rocks to hang around your waist with a vine or a rope and do chin-ups on a tree, knowing that it's going to cut your chances in half of getting cancer, that it's going to cut your chances of getting diabetes by 70%. I'm going to recommend that you find something to do. Don't take a year off. Uh, that would be my advice. All right, next question. As a vegan who is trying to bulk up, one, what was you, uh, your go-to food for protein when you were a vegan? And two, uh, I've been doing it without creatine, blah, blah, blah. Okay, we're going to skip all the questions about creatine. I don't believe in creatine. Yes, I know there's data for novices showing that it seems to speed up some of their aspects of their novice gains. I've never observed this in a human being myself. I've never found it to do anything. I'm just not a fan. I'm aware of the data. Uh, I've got my own opinion on that data. Far too much to cover here. I don't take creatine, and if you do, that's your own choice. I just don't advocate it. I don't see it as useful. Now, as far as uh, the vegan protein sources, yeah, I was a vegan for, I don't know. I lost count. It was either four months, six months, whatever it was. My go-to was generally beans. I loved refried beans. I loved grains. But beans, grains, things like that, that's where I got my protein. If you're eating enough calories, you'll get a lot of protein from these sources. You can find some vegan protein powders if you need them. Uh, protein is out there. It's just you're not going to have the large amounts to get the satiety and other things that people want. But that's generally what I did. I did a lot of refried beans. I did some vegan protein powders. No, I didn't find any I was particularly happy with. They all tasted kind of nasty. But you do what you got to do. Nuts, beans, grains, things like that. Combine them together. You can get up to a decent amount of protein. Uh, not that hard to do. Just make sure that you're not just consuming nothing but low-protein foods. And it's pretty easy. There's plenty of protein uh, in plants. Just it's difficult if you cut down to a really low-calorie diet. That's where it's going to be really hard for you as a vegan to get enough protein. And that is something I had trouble with and that I can relate to. only thing I can tell you there is be very, very selective in your food choices at that point. 
and make sure that you're focused heavily upon high protein vegan foods for everything that you eat if you decide to cut your calories down lower and try to hold on to muscle mass on a vegan diet. That's the hardest part. All right, next question. Hi, Jason. I was wondering what type of periodization you prefer in both your own training and for others. I like block periodization and my lectures prefer cognitive. I think you mean concurrent. I understand the benefits of both and I've used both. Just wanted to know your thoughts. Um, I've experimented with a lot of different types over the years. I generally like for off-season athletes, I like linear block periodization. For in-season athletes, I like concurrent periodization. So I kind of like both depending on what someone's doing. I personally, I've messed a lot with um, like linear type and running basically accumulation phases, uh, alternated with uh, max power phases and peaking phases. But what these days with the rest pause training and stuff I'm doing, I'm actually experimenting around with a loose uh, undulating periodization. It's not real fixed. It's fairly loose, but it is undulating periodization. And I guess you would describe it still as a form of concurrent periodization. And that's what I'm personally using these days. And, and I'm enjoying it. And I seem to be getting results from it. I'm certainly gaining muscle, uh, gaining strength, losing fat. So it's been recompositioning me de decently now that I've gone over to uh, higher rep schemes with the rest pause work. So that's kind of my preference at the time, but I, I certainly still always like linear block periodization for off-season athletes. All right, next question. And from here on out, the next couple are going to be gear-related, drug-related, performance-enhancing related in one form or another. And then I'm going to throw in a personal question at the end. If you're not interested in any of that stuff, you guys have a good day. You can go ahead and cut out now. So let me jump over to the next question. Do you feel that the want slash need for instant gratification will develop a more unhealthy and medical issue ridden generation of lifters? As many of the young guys want to hop on immediately and don't have the knowledge or training and diet experience of some of the greats, would you say they will see more and more medical complications due to the mass amounts of gear being used by kids uh, and gear that has been recently developed without any sort of studies on the long term effects of bodybuilding doses? I think particularly the SARMs on that ladder are going to be a concern because we don't know what they do. And, it's, and they tend to be so expensive that fortunately no one can run them at high doses. I don't know anybody running two or three grams of SARMs a week like we know guys running test. I mean, I've met a guy who runs two <laughs> grams of Trent a week. But nobody's spending that type of money on SARMs, not with what they cost, that I know of at least. So we're not going to see them at the at true bodybuilder doses but as far as some of this goes, I kind of, I guess it varies a bit because as far as a lot of the health effects, I think the biggest concern is going to be the guys who are playing around too much with, if it fits your macro stuff, flexible dieting and eating too much shit food, this micronutrient devoid while stacking hefty amounts of gear, uh, particularly start if they start stacking hefty amounts of orals. I think that's where you're going to see your big risk. Uh, as far as the other health effects, honestly, they've been overrated. Most of the health effects for injectables are not necessarily as bad as they've been made out to be, at least according to all of the available studies and data. The issue with them is that they have run a high risk of shutting down your natural testosterone production, your sperm production, things like that. That is your number one health risk of these substances, and it is a very real risk. That's why I tell guys, if you make this choice that you want to go on these substances, you need to accept a very real possibility that you will be sticking a needle in your butt for the rest of your life in order to maintain your testosterone levels. That is just a risk that is assumed or should be assumed the moment you decide you're going to go on to these things. They might be a lifetime commitment. And if you can't live with that, then you need to stay away from them. Full stop. So that's your biggest concern. A lot of these younger kids are starting younger. It's going to have a higher chance of suppressing them. And so a whole lot more of them are going to be on TRT. It's going to boost the TRT market. But as far as overall health effects, if they're using injectables. If they're using safe injecting uh, methods and they're being sterile about it, they're probably not going to suffer many health effects other than, uh, again, permanent shutdown. But again, that's also assuming they're being conservative in their use. A whole lot of younger guys I see these days are running two grams, three grams, four grams a week. It is getting a bit out of control. And so some of those kids, that small minority who are doing that, that I do see out there, yeah, I think there's a very real possibility we're going to see health issues with them. But let's keep in mind, there aren't tens of thousands of guys doing that. We see them at every gym just about where the stuff's going around and there's a lot of guys on uh, but it, it's not as many as you would think. Most of them are still being fairly conservative, at least that I've talked to. 
So, uh, again, kind of a complicated question. That's the best answer I can really give you with all of that. All right, next question. Hey, Jason, I was wondering if you think there would be any benefit to combining caffeine and a shot of alcohol pre-workout. Because I saw your video on alcohol being a performance-enhancing drug, and I'm already a fan of having caffeine occasionally pre-workout. Thanks. Short answer, yes. Caffeine is a performance-enhancing drug. Drinking alcohol is a performance-enhancing drug and a very high, calorically dense, easy-to-use energy source. So it makes a very efficient training fuel. The problem is that if you're drinking so much that you're getting intoxicated, that will negatively impede your performance. It will increase your risk of injury. You get hurt. When you get hurt, you're going to make less gains. Be realistic here. But as far as small quantities like one shot, yeah, it very well might have a mild performance enhancing effect, particularly combined with caffeine. So it might work. I am going to, again, not advocate <laughs> that you take a shot before you drive to the gym, though. Guys, don't drink alcohol and get in your car and drive. But as far as the performance enhancing benefits, they're both proven performance enhancing drugs. So combining them together, the answer is yes. Obviously, a yes. All right, next question. Hey, Jason, I was wondering if you think there would be any benefit. Hey, Jason, is it possible to gain muscle while on a cruise, or is it better to stay on a calorie maintenance until the next blast to avoid additional fat gains? Thanks. For those who don't know, uh, a lot of people don't cycle. Cycle is kind of a weird theory that's come out on the Internet where guys go on anabolics and then come off and run like a PCT and everything. Blasting and cruising is where guys just stay on a maintenance amount year-round, and they blast when they want to make a lot more gains. They up the dose, have more stuff in their stack. It's called blasting and cruising. And in certain circles, it is a preferred method. Like most pro bodybuilders, serious bodybuilders, they don't cycle. Those guys blast and cruise. Um, question is really difficult to answer. It depends on where you are. You've got to keep in mind, it depends on how far above your natural limit you are, or how close you are to your natural limit. If you're sitting down at a fat-free mass index of 24, like most guys here on gear, let's go back to the fake natty stuff. Most guys on gear are under a 25 fat-free mass index still. If you're down there, you will absolutely be able to make gains on your cruise. Maintenance dose of testosterone, you will still be able to make gains. There'll be slow gains. You shouldn't be bulking. I would still recommend you stay near maintenance calories. Don't try to gain a bunch of weight. Stay near maintenance calories and you will probably recomposition just a little bit on your cruise. If you are basically above your natural limitations, you're sitting over a 25 fat-free mass index, Odds are you're not going to make any significant gains on your cruise. Again, depending on what your cruise consists of. I mean, some guys, if you're running the Rich Piana cruise, you're basically still on as far as your blood levels are concerned. So in his case, it would be different. Someone like running what he's doing. But most guys' cruises who are pretty big, they're not going to make any gains. So again, they stay near maintenance. They will hopefully not lose very much muscle. If you're really big and you're cruising, you will probably lose a small amount of muscle. But you won't gain much, if any, fat as long as you're not overeating. So it's really going to depend on where you are along that scale and really what your cruise looks like. So it can be difficult to pin down, but that should give you some general guidelines on it. All right, uh, last question of the week. A personal question. What events led you to believe that there is some sort of deity? Uh, I understand that this might be classified, so feel free to be vague. Thanks. All right, as I've told you guys again, a lot of people, because they asked me before, what's my beliefs? And I say I'm agnostic. I, I'm an agnostic theist or an agnostic deist. I'm not a Christian. I don't believe in Christianity or any of that. Uh, my mother was religiously Jewish. My father was a Christian. I am very, very well versed in religion, the history of religion, the Bible, the Talmud, the anti Nicene fathers, all this various uh, works of Apocrypha. I'm, I'm actually familiar with most of it. I don't really ascribe to any of that. I believe there's a higher power. I do pray. Uh, the reason I believe there is a deity of some type is that I've had several situations to where it's the most likely answer that I could uh, arrive at. I've had a, a couple of situations where I prayed about things at certain points in my life, and I've never been the type of person I don't believe in praying for things. I think that's nonsense. I don't think any sort of higher power ever answers that sort of stuff. Uh, I've kind of just prayed before in the past and just ask for guidance. And one time I felt like I got an answer when I was doing that and just looking for an answer. And it was almost a word for word answer in my head. And the next day, someone who I was talking about on the topic repeated the exact same phrase to me, word for word. And they started saying something else and they stopped and said, no, that's not what I'm supposed to say to you. And they said the exact phrase and it was an unusual phrase. And that kind of threw me off. Um, I've also had a few situations too where 
same thing happened. I felt like at least some sort of answer came to me of really what I needed to be doing with some aspect or something in my life. And I said, okay, I'm going to do that then. And as soon as I made that decision to do so, multiple factors immediately fell into place to make that situation that I had been really worried about happen when I said, okay, I'm going to do, yeah, the, okay, I'm just going to go with the answer I got. And what I felt inside was the answer when I had prayed. And a lot of factors fell into place immediately, as many as five or six different ones that I wasn't expecting to make that situation just go that direction. So that's why I believe there's probably a higher power. It's not something that I preach to other people. I'm not trying to convert anyone to any belief system. I don't really have a belief system. But I simply believe there is very possibly a God who has some sort of plan that they don't always make known to us. And I occasionally pray and say, hey, what am I supposed to be doing with my life? And if I get some sort of answer, I generally go with it. And I find things tend to always work out when I do. It's not definitive proof. It's, again, not something even worth founding a religion upon. But if someone asks me, uh, why do I generally believe uh, in a higher power? That's my answer. All right, guys, but that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it's been informative, and I will talk to you guys next time.